Uh, okay, so the time to start. So today I'm going to present common errors uh, people make uh, when they use uh, linear regression. So, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. So my name is Kwang Wan. I'm a consultant professor in biostatistics. So, just, uh, I don't have anything to disclose. So today, uh, you're going to focus on three things. So the first one is uh, we are going to review, briefly review linear regression. So, so what linear regression is and so what kind of things we can do, something like that. And then the second, uh, second, the second item is our main, uh, today's main point. So we are going to go over some graphical methods to check linear regression assumptions. And then the third one is kind of just uh, maybe other than assumptions, but then we can, uh, uh, we are going to go over some other some common errors and people, uh, people easily gain. So, so there are evaluation forms. So at the end of the talk or during the talk, so you, so you can evaluate uh, this presentation. So you do some evaluation forms and it will be really appreciated. Uh, linear regression. Um, so linear regression is a uh, very popular and sometimes it's very powerful statistical tool to investigate linear relationship. Uh, so the linear part is kind of important. So linear relationships between response variable and explanatory variables. So, so I try to avoid some mathematical equations for them, this, uh, I think this is the only one I put in mathematical equation. So this is the equation we consider. So uh, y is a response variable, and then beta 0 is the intercept. So in the model, it's a different intercept. So we are going to look at some figure, what's going on there. So x1 is our first explanatory variable, something like gender, or age, or height, weight, something like that. So you want to, so some uh, variable you want to uh, you want to analyze. And the X2 is another experimental variable. So the main point is by, by constructing this linear relationship, so why it's a linear? It's because it's the summation. So uh, by constructing this linear relationship, uh, we can investigate some data. So so that's the main point. So main issue is the kind of the beta i. So if beta i is significant, so if beta i is significant, then the corresponding variable is a significant. For example, so if H, so and then we estimate beta 1, so the impact of H on our response variable, and then if it turned out to be significant based on the typically p value, then uh, then kind of just uh, we can just, uh, you know, just uh, predict some outcomes, we can just uh, evaluate the impact of H on our response variable, something like that. So the main focus is kind of just estimating beta in linear regression. Uh, so, and then many textbooks and many literature uh, use different terminologies. So uh, many, many textbooks call this x1, x2, xp. So they call it as exponential variables, but then sometimes it's called also uh, independent variables or covariates, regressors, Predictors, so there are a lot of names, but then they are uh, they are pointing out the same thing, so they are the same thing. And then also response variable is also called the dependent variable. And then other than those terminologies, there are other terminologies people use. Uh, but then this is the uh, most popular terminologies people so typically use. Uh, so uh, uh, let's look at just a simple example. So. So we wanna uh, let let us uh, suppose that we investigate the relationship between red length, so red length. So that's our response variable, which is y, and then the exponential variables of predictors. We have two predictors, weight and temperature. So we wanna investigate. So let's assume kind of we are investigating this relationship. So we consider the following model. So our uh, red length is our response variable, and then intercept. So we estimate intercept, which is 5. Let's assume that. And then the 2 times weight, and then the unit is gram, and then 0.3 times temperature. So that's uh, the, the unit of temperature is Fahrenheit. 
so then how can you interpret uh, this uh, this relationship? So, so when you run some program, so I'm not sure what kind of program you use, so Excel or maybe SAS or SPSS or Stata or R, something like that. So when you're gonna obtain is those numbers, five to point three and corresponding p values. So based on the p value. If p value is smaller than typically 0.5, then you think it's significant. So then we are going to keep, keep those variables in the model, something like that. So and then the interpretation, then how can you interpret the results? So interpretation is, so if, uh, so given, given actually when the temperature is held fixed, if weight increase by one unit, so the unit is gram. So if weight increase one gram. Then our length, the response variable, will increase by two millimeter. So, so that's the that's the interpretation. And the temperature is the same. So the important thing is when the weight is fixed, we assume it's fixed. Weight, we just adjust adjust the weight first. Then, if the temperature increases by one unit, then length will increase by 0.3. So that's the interpretation. Uh, so people use uh, linear regression a lot. So many because it's powerful, it's easy, and then many times Excel has some macro, something like that. So people just use that. Uh, but then the kind of from a statistical point of view, this model, this model is constructed under some assumptions. So which means this model is valid only if those assumptions are satisfied. So. If those assumptions are not satisfied, we we cannot guarantee our model is appropriate or correct. So without checking those assumptions, it may lead some kind of incorrect conclusions. So it may be misleading. So that's why kind of it's important to check some uh, so, uh, those statistical assumptions so after fitting the model. So if uh, if those assumptions are satisfied. Then uh, we can, so we can trust. Uh, okay, so this model it works. This model is correct. Something like that. So then every conclusion uh, is correct. So today, so we wanna focus on what kind of assumptions there uh, there are, and then just uh, how can you check those assumptions. So if uh, if those assumptions are violated, then kind of you need to do something else. But um, we are not gonna focus on remedies. So we are gonna focus on how to check uh, assumptions. So but then at the end, kind of I'm gonna explain to some remedies briefly. Uh, so the first assumption is a linearity assumption. So because uh, as we saw uh, in the previous equation, just some mathematical equation, so we assume the relationship is linear. So it's like a y is equal to x1 plus x2 plus x3, something like that. So that, that's our assumption. So we need to check whether our linear assumption is appropriate. And then uh, let's define residuals. So residuals is our observation minus fitted value. So this fitted value is from the final model. So in the previous Previous example, this is our fitted, uh, fitted model. Then you just plug in weight and temperature, then you, and then you, you are going to get predicted value. So that's the fitted value. So if you put 100 and 10, then you are going you are going to have some value. So that's the fitted value. And then, so that is our expected value. But then, you know, when uh, weight is 100 and temperature is equal to 10, then you are going to have some observation. So observation minus fitted value. So what is the difference? So that's the uh, so that's the residuals. So we are, so we are going to use these residuals a lot uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, so to investigate the linear relationship, uh, you can check various uh, various plots. So the first one is just uh, the most simplest one. Just uh, plot y versus Xi. So, so if you have three covariates like the age, gen, uh, age, and the weight and height, something like that, then for each variable you can just plot. So and then whether kind of it has some linear trend. So we are going to see the graph in the next slide. And then, but the more more popular one is the second or third one. So a scatter plot of residual versus Xi or finite value. So. If you have multiple uh, regressors or uh, 
uh, vertical predictors, then you need uh, maybe you can uh, you can just one by one, residual versus x1, and then residual versus x2, something like that. But then another another way to go is just uh, you can just you just, just simply fit the value. So this is just a uh, just a very simple example. So we have response variable y, and then we have only one predictor, just a, only one predictor, just x. So, so in terms of kind of drawing graph, it's just a, a one predictor is so convenient. So that's why I brought uh, this example. So when linearity assumption is satisfied, so although I said linearity assumption is satisfied, but then if everything is fine, I mean every assumption is satisfied, then kind of the graph looks like that. It should be look like this. So this is the relationship. So here is y. So our response variable. And here is x, so our predictor. So and then x is increasing. So if you look at the data, so each dot is a data. If you look at the data, then it's overall, yeah, it, it looks like it's linear. So it, this is the meaning of linear. So it's, it looks like it's linear. So it doesn't look like it's curved or it's decreased or something like this. So it's, it's really increasing. Or the other way is just the observation is like that, then it's increasing. So Important thing is some linear trend. You, you you have to see kind of linear trend. So then uh, this is the first. Uh, just, uh, you can examine uh, linear assumption from this graph, but then sometimes it, it's not clear. So sometimes it, it looks like it's fine, but then when you look up a uh, uh, plot of residuals versus x, it may it may not uh, you may find it's not correct, something like that. So so as I explained, residuals is defined our observation minus our predictive value is it there. So the first residual is uh, 4 point something minus some something. So this is the residual. So as you can see, so this one. So 1 point something. So this difference is one, around 1.5. Mm -hmm. And then it's positive. So that's why it's there. So here is a 0. So and then the second residual is our observation minus predictive value right there. So then it's minus. So it's a negative sign, so that's why it's there. So and so on. So the most important thing, so this plot, we are gonna use this plot a lot throughout this presentation. So because so basically when you when you need to observe, so when you hope to observe in this plot is it is the scatter plot looks like a random. It must be uh, it must look like a random. So then it's fine. So that's the basic, basic, that's the baseline. It should look kind of random. So there's no trend or something like that. So, so if you look at this plot, yeah, it, yeah, it's a scattered, yeah, so, so it's random. I didn't say any trend. So then, oh, it's fine. So we are going to use this uh, plot uh, numerous times throughout uh, this presentation. So this is a, just a good example. So, so, and then but then, but. If the linear assumption is not satisfied, this is one you are going to observe. So first of all, this is our data. So I artificially created the data. So then, as you can see, so this is our period linear model, linear regression model. So this is our period value. So and then, as you can see, it, 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 so if you look at follow, if you uh, follow the blue blue line, then the trend is not linear; it's, it's curved. So then, kind of you cannot you know, maybe kind of you, you may have to think about the uh, different model rather than just a linear model because the trend is not linear. So you can see there is a curve. So if you look at residual plot, then you can see the trend more clearly. So when you look at look up the residuals, so then the first four residuals, so they are positive area. So this guy minus this guy, this guy minus this guy, this guy minus this guy, and so on. So there are positive, positive ones. And then the middle one, they are all negative right there. And then the the, le uh, the last part is all positive. So it's not really random. It's like the breeze shape. So there is some trend. It, it doesn't look like really random. So then uh, you should know, uh, you, sh uh, you should think about, oh, okay, so, so then, uh, our model, this model, the final model is in trouble. So we need to do something else, something like that. So if the, so as you can see, if the linear linearity assumption is not satisfied, you can see some trend. 
So this is only one strand, so you may see this kind of one or something like this. So if it doesn't look at, look like random, then you should uh, you should notice that oh there's something wrong there. So the second option is uh, second assumption is IID normal. Uh, just the normal means just normal distribution in statistics. So errors. So it is corresponding to residuals. So we we assume in statistics we assume uh, they are all independent and then they have yeah identically distributed. They have the same distribution. But then independence and normal, which is the uh, which are the most important uh, assumptions. So. So normal distribution means it's a bell-shaped curve. So the in the middle, around the mean, is the most observations there. But then so when you uh, just uh, draw the histogram, so it should be like a bell-shaped curve. So that's the basically you may think, oh, that's the normal distribution, something like that. So so in general, we need to check uh, three assumptions, uh, three cases. So the first one is check whether the errors have a constant variance. Constant variance, so variance of errors. So, so it means kind of just errors at the beginning and the errors at the middle and the, at the at the at the end. So the the distribution, the spread, the spreading of spread of errors should be kind of just similar. So it shouldn't have some kind of trend. So we are gonna look up uh, some figures. Uh, and then the second one is the. Uh, check whether errors are normally distributed. So errors are just uh, if you, if I pull out kind of histogram, it looks like a pear shape or it's skewed, something like that. So if it's skewed, then oh, there's an issue. So the third one is uh, whether errors are independent. So we are going to look at residual plot again. So the first one, constant variance. So constant variance means so errors must have the same variance. So that's the constant variance. So why we are examining this? Because we, under this assumption, the model is okay. But then without this option, assumption, our model may not be okay. So that's why we need to check this assumption. So the constant variance, so again, the variance of errors, so it should be constant. So whether x is small or large, should be constant. So, so let's look at this figure. So then uh, why is our response variable? So at the beginning, so it so so first of all, first of all, okay, it looks like okay, it looks like okay, it looks like a linear, okay, so maybe linear linearity may be fine, uh, but then uh, when you look up the uh, residuals versus x, then you can see the error at the beginning is they are really concentrated on around zero, but then errors at the end they are really spreading, so it means. The, it may indicate like the errors of this variance. So if the variance is constant, then it, it must be looks like random. So the distribution at the beginning, middle, at the end, it should be kind of same. But then, so clearly you can see, so the, the errors are spreading so as x goes, x, uh, as x increases. So it, it indicates like, uh, yeah, so it looks like errors or uh, variance. It's increasing as x increasing, so so it's not right. So again, it's the same thing. If it doesn't look like random, then so uh, you are in trouble. That model is in trouble. So that's the meaning. So so another shape is possible, like the the other direction. This this triangle or diamond is also fine. So so kind of when you uh, whenever you see non-random plot, non-random residual plot, then you, you should think about, oh, <coughs> like, uh, yeah, this model may not be correct. So normality, uh, normality is, uh, uh, we assume errors are normally distributed, so again, it's a pear shaped curve. So this is the another example. So this is the period value. So if it is a pear shape, then around the kind of period value, the distribution uh, the distribution of upper side and lower side it should be similar because it's a pear shape, it's a symmetric. Uh, so as you can see, at the you know just a, the distribution of this one and the distribution because they are very close to the value compared to those uh, those errors, those uh, observations. So you may think just the uh, oh, the numerical assumption is violated. So another way to look at it is just a, uh, just a, uh, just a plot the histogram of errors. So that's uh, that's possible. 
So our our field value is like that. It's completely off our observation. So then, yeah, of course, uh, in this graph, it's obvious. Yeah, these are two outliers. It's obvious. But um, uh, sometimes it, it, it's, it, uh, it may not be clear, especially kind of there are a lot of observations around there. Then kind of you can use kind of standard, uh, standardized uh, residuals versus x. So then, then when you can see, it's the minus 2 and positive 2. So if it's outside of this balloon line, then it may be, they may be outliers. But then actually, in our example, so our true outliers are these two, but then one of them is inside minus two, but then it's pretty close to minus two. And then the other one, the last one, this one, is the, here it is. So, and then based on this graph, if you look at this graph only, then this is also maybe potential outlier. Then, then what you can do is kind of just based on these observations, just go back to the data and see uh, uh, to see kind of what's going on there. So, and clearly, so we have kind of three candidates. Here is two, and then here is one. And then, if you look at the data, then you, you can clearly see that these are two outliers. So, if there is a, if there are some outliers, then. The, uh, oh, sorry, this, there's a typo. <laughs> this must be outliers, sorry. Uh, if they are outliers, clearly it's going to impact your results a lot, significantly. So you need, to, uh, you need to be very careful uh, dealing with these outliers. I'm going to explain kind of in maybe a couple of slides. Uh, another issue you may uh, encounter in linear regression is multicollinear, uh, multicollinearity. This is not really headache, it's just, uh, yeah, just, uh, this is a kind of tough problem to solve, actually. Uh, so one of the, our assumptions is uh, our predictor, uh, predictors, I mean exponential variables, uh, they are totally independent of each other. That's our assumption. Uh, but the multicollinearity means the predictor variables are strongly correlated. So x1, x2, so for example, high 10 weight, you put high 10 weight together, then it's highly likely they are strongly correlated. So then if you put those variables kind of, uh, in linear regression together, then you may have, uh, you may observe kind of very weird numbers, weird conclusion, weird kind of just, put, uh, just the parameter values, something like that. So when some of the predictor var uh, variables are highly correlated, it's just in, so somehow, in some sense, in some degree, if they are kind of slightly correlated, then in, in general, it's fine, it's okay. But then, if they are strongly correlated, then that's a really problem. So the multicollinearity is, in that case, is if they are strongly correlated, then kind of whole regression results may be totally, totally misleading. So we are gonna look up the example in the next slide. So, so in that, well, when you put, two strongly correlated or more correlated, so, so maybe three or four uh, correlated uh, variables to the model at the same time, then in general, not, not always, but um, in general, the estimated coefficients, so just the uh, beta one, beta two, that kind of values, they are very sensitive to the addition or deletion of correlate, uh, correlated predictors. So if they are completely independent, so whether you put the first one, second one, or first, second, third, then in general, in general, the numbers, for them, estimated numbers, but I mean the effect of kind of those first two uh, variables should be similar. So when you compare with two, uh, two exponential variables or three exponential variables, the first two uh, variables, the impact, the effect of first two variables, estimated values should be kind of similar. But then, when uh, when kind of you put kind of strongly correlated variables at the same time, then when you eliminate one of them or add another one, then those values values are kind of fluctuating, so it may change a lot. So that's kind of the typical observation people uh, people make. Uh, so so and then another issue is the, if you put two strongly correlated variables into one model, then then, uh, then, then, kind of, uh, this is just, just some stuff coming out of it, but then at the end, kind of just uh, correlated variables, they may show like uh, really large p-values. So, so you may think, oh, these two 
variables are not significant at all. So I'm going to eliminate those two variables, something like that. But then in fact, in fact, if you put one of them or each, each variable, it just strongly predict, uh, it just strongly associate with our response variable. So they must be significant. But then if you put kind of just uh, co highly correlated variables at the same time, sometimes the p values are kind of so so large, so you, it's highly likely you, you, you may be, you may you may you may kind of drop one of them or both of them from the model, something like that. So then, kind of just your final conclusion may be incorrect. So in practice, multicollinearity may be present. If so, there are a lot of possibilities, but then this is the most most uh, common cases, I think. Uh, the, when you receive the result from by your sub, so, so just a linear regression, your linear regression model, or from statistician, even statistician, then the effect of predictors is not consistent with what you expected. So, for example, so you think this must be uh, the impact of this variable must be positive, but then the final result is shows you kind of oh, it's a negative. So then oh, this is kind of very strange. Then you can, uh, of course, you can check your data or something like that. But everything is fine. Then maybe yeah, there is a multicollinearity issue. So maybe you put this variable and then another variable, so one of the or two of the, the other variables, maybe highly correlated with this one. So that affects the kind of the conclusion, something like that. And then the second case is the predictors. So you strongly believe it must be significant. So, so strongly believe that this must be significant. Uh, do not show any significance. So then you may think just based on your expertise or based on, based on experience, oh, then there's something wrong or there might be multicollinearity issue or maybe linear regression model is correct. That's also possible. But um, uh, this is just from uh, your expertise. Uh, so this is an example. So our response variable is y. And then we have two covariates. So one is x1, and then the other one, second one is x2. So as you can see, x1 predicts y very well. So this is a completely linear relationship. So fine. And the y, the x2 also has strong uh, linear relationship with y. So both variables are significant. Both variables are significant. Uh, but then if you look at x1 and x2, then you can see they are highly correlated. So correlation is actually 0.858. So it's, a, it's very close to 0.9. So if the correlation is close to 1, then it means they are pa highly pa positively correlated. So they are strongly, strongly correlated. So then, so this is the this is just from statistical software. So, so when you put x1 only, when you put x1 only, then your estimate, your estimate estimated value is 2.99. So it means if x1 increases by one unit, y will increase about three. Exactly just 2.99, and then p value is very significant. And then if you put, uh, sorry, another type, sorry, the coefficient of x2, sorry, uh, my project. So so when you put x2, then the coefficient is 0.5. Uh, 0.594. So, so based on this model, when x2 increases by one unit, then y will increase by 0.594. So, so that, so anyway, so if you if you analyze data one by one, yeah, both must be significant. But then, when you put uh, both variables at the same time, so this is the multiple linear regression. So, y versus x1 and x2. So you put both variables together. Then this is the result. This is also one of the many many kinds of many many so many many kinds of trends. So, so this is the estimated value. So x1 3.06 uh, 3.036, which is really close to the first one. Okay, which is good. But then look at the x2. X2 is almost like a zero, and the p value is highly it's too high. So, so if you put both variables together then you may conclude, oh, x2 is not significant. So, something like that. So, but, um, but uh, actually, actually, it's a significant. Okay, so this is the multicollinearity problem. So, or, 
many times, many times, when a post variables p values are really high. So that's also possible. Then at the end, oh, post variables, hey, I guess one x two, yeah, they are not significant, so I'm gonna drop all of them, something like that. Then at the end, you are gonna lose kind of significant uh, variables affect y. So just uh, remedies, uh, there are a lot of remedies. Uh, just uh, uh, we statisticians examine kind of assumptions one by one, but uh, if one of them is violated, then we look up some other remedies. So but, um, there are a lot of remedies, but um, this is just a, uh, just a brief description. So the most popular remedy is the data transformation. So you transform y, to some, so most popular is a log transformation. So it's gonna stabilize your variance, or the, it looks like more linear, or something like that. Or some other data transformation is like the, you, you you can transform your predictors like the. Uh, so previously I used the x, but um, at this time I'm gonna use x square or x cube, so something like that. So so if you uh, transform your data. And uh, you may cure, may may cure uh, violations of linearity or common variance issue, I and mean, heterogeneous of variance or normal assumptions, something like that. So, but then um, uh, data transformation needs to be uh, carefully examined. So, uh, so but then uh, after transform your data, you need to examine assumptions one by one again. So that's. And then, kind of to make sure, kind of all assumptions are satisfied. Uh, the for outliers, uh, the most popular one is just uh, people just typically eliminate outliers from the data. Uh, that's okay if you have a large sample. So it's typically okay. Or another example is just uh, data transformation because if you transform data somehow, kind of just uh, they just uh, outliers is kind of closer to kind of general. Kind of just, I mean, the most of the data, so that's also possible. But um, uh, for outliers, kind of, so from my point of view, when you eliminate outliers, you, you should be very, very careful. This is just from my point of view, uh, because uh, outliers, maybe if you observe outliers, maybe they may first of all, it's maybe just a true outliers, so that's then, yeah, it's problematic, so just, just eliminate maybe just a dirty data, so then you can, you can just eliminate those if you have a lot of data, but then, um, uh, but then kind of it may be caused by like the decoding data data coding problem. So it was supposed to be ten, but then somehow put one or one hundred something like that. So that may cause outliers. Uh, but then um, everything is fine. You know, the data recording is correct. The period of, uh, period of model is correct. Everything is correct. Then uh, you should be very very careful because. So let's look at this graph again. So this really depends on the PI. It, it, it doesn't depend on statistician. So we, from our point of view, yeah, these are just uh, outliers. So if data is larger, then we are gonna eliminate those too. Or we, we can just transform to somehow is to make these, these most of data and these two observations make closer. Then maybe kind of then kind of just uh, they maybe belong to trans in the transform the data. Maybe kind of they are close enough. Uh, and then so those two uh, uh, observations may turn out to be outliers. So, so that's, that's, that's fine. But um, uh, when you eliminate outliers, you should be very, very careful because, because so sometimes it happens. So uh, digital outliers, so it's a weird observation. So it's a totally off from the general trend. So, but then, but if these Two observations are really true observation. Is so there's nothing wrong with that? But then, then it will give you most maybe it will give you most important uh, information on that value. Right. And how can't you develop a statistical rationale for deciding whether or not to eliminate outliers? For example, suppose we have four outliers in this set of data. Uh -huh. uh, would there be a way just you would say you shouldn't eliminate any of them? Or you can eliminate two of the four? Uh, there's, there's oh, no okay. way to do that? Okay, uh, good question. So uh, 
if data large, if data is large, like uh, maybe hundreds of data is there, then maybe eliminating two or four doesn't matter. So uh, asymptotically, one, at the end, what you're going to have is kind of, it's almost the same. So almost the same. But then if your data is not large, then you should be very, very careful. So for outliers, although kind of I explained kind of just uh, st standardized residuals versus X, so and then look at two and minus two, although I explained the such, but then uh, in case of outliers, we have some statistical procedure to test uh, individual. So, so we have some objective procedure. So we, that's what we typically do. You do have that. Right, 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 right. So then, based on those kind of just a mathematical model, then if we violate, okay, this is a problem, then just we decide to eliminate those. Uh, but then, if, but then kind of, uh, when you uh, talk to statistician, you need to ask whether there's outlier or you just examine the outliers. And then, they, uh, yeah, yeah, we examine the outliers, then we eliminate some of the observations. Then kind of you need to ask them, so what are those? So what are those observations? Because because they are really off the uh, just the general trend, but then it doesn't mean they are not valuable. Just they are just trash. It doesn't mean that because uh, who knows from from nine or from ten, these are the true trend. So from ten, it's just completely dry. So in that sense, kind of you may have tons of information there. So that's why, because I typically do not recommend eliminating outliers. So so I just. Uh, so from my point of view, what I will do is if I observe outliers, then so I'm gonna to transform the data so somehow to keep all observations. In. So because each observation is important. So kind of if you eliminate some observations, then it means we are losing some information. That, that's my preference. That's my preference. But then some other people have different preference. But then that's my preference. So and then so whenever I uh, I observe these kind of outliers, I always ask the investigators whether uh, whether this is really true one, is it really trash or is it really valuable? So if they are ah, I think this is trash, then yeah, then okay. So I'm gonna transform data, but then even if even after transforming data, I still have those outliers. Then so at the end, this is, I'm gonna just uh, eliminate. Oh, of course, uh, we are gonna test the kind of some statistical method to see whether this is how like. Do you say transform? Are you talking about transforming nonlinear bit to a linear line? Uh, trans okay. Um, this is the linear. Of course, there is a very complicated model, nonlinear model. It's possible. Yeah, there, there is a linear but, but then, uh, this is a linear model. Uh, linear model. Great feature of linear model is kind of interpretation is so easy, but. Uh, uh, what I'm talking about transform is the. What I mean by transform is the. Yeah, maybe maybe look at this model. So transformation, transform is there are two kinds of transformation. So, uh, first of all, this is a linear model. So, so for this stuff, we do not consider nonlinear functions like the weight times temperature square or something like that. So there's no time. It's just, uh, of course, we can uh, think about interaction, but the interaction is, OK. So that, you know, but then, uh, if, you uh, if you focus on this one, so then transformation means, first of all, kind of the most popular one, if the response variable is uh, positive, then log transformation. Then, then our model, our model is log length is equal to intercept plus some, something times weight plus something times temperature. We fit that model. So then, when you predict the length, then we just take an exponential function to transform to the original unit. So that's so that's the transformation. That's the most popular. So log or just some, some other transformation is possible. But then, so that's what I'm talking about transformation. And then another another kind of transformation is uh, predictors. So for example. Yeah, look at this one. If you look at this one, then so clearly it's off linearity. Just uh, it's, uh, there is some some uh, linearity. So then then what I'm gonna do? So either way, so uh, I'm gonna transform y. Or but um, or another way is you, you can transform x. So you use the x for for the first time, but then uh, you can use oh it, it, it looks like a, like a x square something like that. So then you put 
x square instead of x. So then, then uh, when you're gonna have, uh, sorry, yeah, when you're, for example, in this case, length is equal to some intercept plus some something you need to estimate again plus weight square, not the weight. So weight square. So you are gonna put weight square. Then, then after transforming uh, this little variable and then look at the, just the graph again, then many times it looks like a linear because because, because it's weight square. So it's a, you put some nonlinear procedure, but then overall it's still structure is something plus something plus something. There is no product or divide by or e to the something or something like that. So uh, so that that's that's what I mean by transformation. But then it's very very careful when you transform that. It's very very careful. So again, uh, there is some statistical procedure how to transform that based on the data. So we same data then. Uh, based on data, oh, this is this transformation is recommended, so then we just do that. It's the, that's what we typically do. So that, so that's why uh, I said kind of data transformation needs to be carefully examined. It's not like just the uh, this transformation works kind of every case is something like that. It's not like that. And then okay, outliers. So, but uh, when you eliminate our eyes, uh, you should be careful from my point of view. Uh, correlated errors. So, if the errors are correlated or there is a trend, so if it is a time series, sometimes the time series models uh, often used to model error terms. Uh, but um, uh, this requires uh, some statistical analogy. And then the collinear, collinear, collinear data, uh, it's kind of really headache to me. So, honestly, it's really headache to me. So, so one model, so one, one way to go is the dropping one of the variables. But then, because dropping one of the highly correlated variables, then you can think just, uh, you can make the uh, all variables kind of independent or semi-independent or something like that. But then, if you want to keep all the variables, then um, maybe just principal component regression is another statistical model. So just uh, to eliminate the correlation. So that's the basic principle. So it, it can be used, to, but then uh, increasing sample size is always preferred. So it's, if it's possible, then if you increase uh, sample size, then you you will have for two correlated uh, predictors. So you may have uh, more more uh, more information on that. So then uh, once you obtain a lot of information, accumulate a lot of information, each then it may make kind of their kind of just they may kind of separate, it's like the independent. So you have more and more information. So you can distinct these two more clearly, something like that. Uh, but um, honestly, yeah, this multicollinearity issue is kind of really headache. So today, kind of, uh, I focused on graphical methods. So because it is, it's designed for non statisticians but um, uh, the most important thing is kind of when you uh, fit the linear model, then, so uh, I, I talked to some, you know, many um, MDs or biologists, and they make their own conclusion without checking any assumptions. So, so typically they use kind of just some simple statistical program or Excel, something like that. So I say use Excel macro, something like that. So okay, that's fine, but then the, but then the, you need to make sure, you need, you need to make sure all assumptions are satisfied. Then your model is fine. So, but then you can just, Briefly, just quickly check the kind of those assumptions based on the graph. Based on the graph. Um, so if you just if you use linear uh, regression conclusion without checking assumptions, it may draw incorrect results. So and then, uh, but then if some of the assumptions are violated, then then you need to think about them this very very carefully. So in that case. I don't know, this is my recommendations. <laughs> so we, we have free drug consulting services. So you know, MCW and Cancer Center and the hospital, and then just VA hospital, and then even Markin University. So you can just uh, uh, go to drugging service and then to discuss your data or your analysis if you did. And um, then kind of just our uh, statistician, one of the statisticians will consult, uh, consult with you. And then if there is an issue, 
kind of we can assert kind of immediately, then kind of you can apply for a uh, consulting application. Then uh, typically we assign uh, page, one PhD statistician, uh, which is one of the faculty members, and then just uh, one master level statistician or one graduate student uh, then to solve those issues. So that's what we do. So that's it. So any questions? Uh, can you go back to the collinearity issues? Yeah. Uh, uh, next. I mean, uh, this one? Yeah. yeah. Uh, for example, in this case, y variable is, uh, if you consider the two variables separately, they are both significant. But if you put both into the model, for example, if they are, both of them are not significant, what do you do? You mean, uh, you put both variables into the model and then both variables turn out to be not significant or something like that? Right, right. Uh, yeah, so that's why, that's why, <laughs> that's why at the beginning, uh, I, so if I analyze the data based on linear regression, uh, I always check kind of correlation among predictors first. So to see whether they are highly correlated. Of course, uh, frankly speaking, if I'm busy, I don't do that. But uh, no, so if I have time, so then I carefully examine x1, x2, x1, x3. So if they are highly correlated, then kind of, then kind of, uh, just I care, I need to careful, uh, carefully examine those two. Especially when you put backward elimination or some selection procedure, then, then if you put. Uh, Working co it's a highly correlated uh, predictors together, then sometimes, actually quite often, they drop both variables at the end. So that, that happens. So, uh, or at least one of them, at least one of them. So then just, uh, uh, but then we could, without examining x1, x2, then yeah, based on the result, oh, both variables are not significant, then you may think, oh, both variables are not significant, so I need to eliminate those two, something like that. But then, uh, so that's why uh, before you use some selection procedure, you should be, you should care, you should carefully examine correlation among variables. If they are highly correlated, then maybe if I were you, I would eliminate just one of them and then put the others and then just uh, select uh, some variables, some, something like that. Or you can just think about just a uh, just, uh, diff completely different uh, model, like a principal component on it, that's one of the options, something like that. So you may think in such a way. So, but um, uh, based on this just result, just of course are not significant, then I cannot say anything, just, uh, but um, I, can, I can talk to PI and then PI has expertise, and then so, uh, it must be significant because there's something wrong. Then, then maybe you can just go back and check whether they are correlated. But then, uh, from my point of view, at the beginning, you need to check uh, correlation among predictors at the beginning. And then if they are highly correlated, then uh, you may talk to PI. So if they are highly correlated, it, it, because kind of both variables, or three variables uh, contain basically the same information, so something like that. So, but if the PI consists of including those three variables at the same time, then you may think about different procedure. So it's not like a really simple kind of linear regression. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much.